Eternity and it's my channel and welcome back. It has been a while. Um, the video you last saw was actually found in like February, January-ish. I know I look pale. I'm sorry. I am pale. I also want to say I cut my hair again. I'm still trying to figure out how to style it so I don't want to hear you say anything about it. Please don't. Anyway, so I'm back in a new location. This is actually in front of my bed. I wanted a little more homey vibes. So back there we have my first marshmallow. That would be the other dogs. That's Colton. We have Nova and Ginger right here. They will be joining us for today, and I wanted more cozy vibes for the new series I'm starting on this channel, and that is called Charlton's and Swindlers. Please ignore the dogs in the background. Um, Charlton's and Swindlers is a new series I'm starting on my channel that was expired by a couple of things. I have been noticing since like November, December, maybe even January, that many big box companies like Hulu, Netflix, those sort of things are making stories based on true life crimes, but crimes that I've known for years and are completely like changing it up to make it more TV worthy, movie worthy, whatever you want to say. So I'm talking like Anna Delvey, the Tinder Swindler, the Pamela Hupp case, Pamela Anderson. There's so many, I have like a list of 10. And for some reason, Hollywood just decided to put all these out at the exact same time, not even spread them out. Like the lists I just mentioned are like five of them on a list of 15 that have all come out since like December, January, whatever. And as someone who's an avid true crime fan, I know these stories and the real stories for years. I want to shout out Kendall Ray for this. I've known them. I've known the Anna Delvey, the Elizabeth Holmes, the Pamela Hupp stories for years. And just to see, watch these TV shows knowing the real story, and then knowing what really happened, what they dramatized, got me thinking about starting a new series on my channel, Charlton's and Swindlers, as you can guess. So it was also inspired by a Kendall Ray video, again, where she took, I think it's called Catch Me If You Can, some sort of movie or whatever, based on a true life crime, and then talked about the movie, and then talked about what really happened. That's what we're doing here today, I want to talk about. Today we're going to start with something a little different. Uh, we're going to be talking about a documentary on Netflix called the tinder swindler as i just said and the case is a little different because in my opinion it's a documentary obviously it's a documentary so documentaries mostly have to and unlike dramatized tv shows or anything like that they don't have to be based in so this was a series that i wanted to start especially with this this episode because it gives you an idea of what this series is going to be because we're talking about a documentary like i said everything has to pretty much be true and then i'm going to go over what really did happen we're going to start with TV show, whatever, and then we're gonna go into what really did happen. So let's go. Like always, if I'm looking off to the side, it's because my iPad is right there. I have a script. Uh, like I mentioned in the Desert Killer case, I was gonna try bullet notes. I did try it this time, but that did not really help that much. The script is still 27 pages, single space, 12 font, Times New Roman. So I literally wrote an essay. Nova's upside down back. As I stated, this case is called the Tinder Swindler. As you can guess, this case starts on the infamous dating app, Tinder. Tinder is notorious for two polar opposite things, hookup and finding true love. Like everything in the 21st century, of the digital age, dating has gone online. People would love to meet someone in person at the grocery store or at the park, but if we learn anything from the horror movie Fresh, that can be dangerous. You can find a bit of everything on Tinder. There are people looking for a long-term relationship or marriage, people who just want to hook up. You can pick from people all over the world. You're essentially looking for a diamond in the rough and always Google the person you go on a date with. Or at least that's what I'm quoting from the documentary. I've never actually been on a dating app personally myself. In 2018, I'm gonna butcher these names, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try my best, but in 2018, Vasil Fahoy, Fahoy? Hope I'm saying that right. A native Norwegian who resided in London, England, was wiping through profiles on Tinder when she came across a dating profile showcasing private jets, cool cars, and crazy parties taking place all over the world. One little swipe right changed her life forever. It was a match. Fahoy had been on Tinder for over seven years and in two different countries, Norway and England. She had over 1,024 maps. She had this dating app thing down to a science. What pictures to have, what her likes and dislikes stated in her description, and most importantly, how she was not into hookup culture. Cecile was a romantic at heart. Some of the happiest moments in her life had come from when she was in love. She had been known to say the thing about love is that it's such an amazing thing to experience. Even after heartbreak, still go after it. Plus, she just loved online dating. Cecile felt like there was something special right away with this Tinder match. She got nervous and she loved that feeling. She chases that all-consuming love, the kind you see in Disney movies. Cecile had matched with a name named Simon Levy. His profile had him dressed in Sir Alice designer outfits and suit with a link to his Instagram profile, where there were several more photos and even more thousands of followers. Posting the man in business meetings, at parties, hanging out on the beach, etc, etc. Simon responded almost immediately to Cecile's swipe right and messaged her asking if she would want to meet up the next night before he leaves London. Their conversation quickly moves to the app. What 
outside, Aaron messages her to meet him at his hotel for coffee, along with the Google Google Maps link to his hotel for season. She believed this meetup was gonna be like an hour long talk because he seemed like a busy man. Priscilla arrives at this super fancy hotel and immediately feels out of place. She sits down and waits extremely nervous. The elevator opens up and Simon walks out, looking exactly like photos. He has this natural magnetic energy to him and she feels like he's something special. They immediately start talking about his job. Simon was the CEO of LLD Diamonds. His father was apparently the king of diamonds, which makes him the prince of diamonds. Cecil is fascinated. The conversation switches to his personal life, which she likes. He has a daughter who is turning two in a few weeks from a previous relationship and that is the reason why he's in London, to visit her. They talk about how Simon is rarely in one place for a long time and how he misses having someone to come home to at the end of the night. Near the end of the date, Simon tells Cecile that he wants to get to know her better. His team and himself are traveling to Bulgaria for a business and if she wants to join them on a private jet he just charted. Which I can say, just say, you don't invite someone you just met onto a private jet to travel anywhere, especially internationally. That sounds like a horror movie waiting to happen. Cecile had never done something like this before and it felt like it'd be stupid to turn down the opportunity. So she says, sure. Simon sends one of his drivers in a yellow Rolls Royce to take her back home and to pack her bags and to grab her passport. He texts her Facebook messenger girlfriend group chat to tell her about her date and where she was going. They were all freaking out thinking that she might be abducted, which is very valid, but it wasn't even a thought in her mind. Red flag number one. They arrive at the airport where the entire team is waiting for them, along with a tall man who is presumed to be a bodyguard. The drivers and Simon's daughter, along with her mom, who is his ex, will also be joining them on a date. Meeting children on the first date? Red flag number two. There's champagne and sushi on this plane, even caviar. When they land in Bulgaria, Bill, the baby, and her mother are all put into one car, and the rest of the people, including Simon, get into different cars. She asks the baby mama some questions and learns how wonderful of a father Simon was, and how he's still fully financially supporting them even though they are separate, which Cecile likes to hear. At the hotel, they check in. On the way up in the elevator, Simon and Cecile are full on making out, and they end up sleeping together that night. After she notices that Simon has scar marks on his back, and he claims they're from his time in a South African jail, where he went to on false pretense when a deal had gone bad and he was manhandled for being Jewish. Simon suddenly starts receiving a ton of phone calls and tells Cecile that she should probably head back home to London being as he was so busy in Bulgaria. Disappointed because she wanted to spend more time with him, she heads home. Back in London, Cecile thinks that the conversation is just going to die out no matter how much she wants to continue getting to know him. But the opposite happened. Morning and night texts, FaceTime calls, and just constantly talking to each other. It was difficult to meet up with Simon again, being as he was constantly traveling for business. Cecile was heading back to for a trip in Oslo, Norway, when she asked Simon to join her. They never got to see each other in person. He takes a private jet and lands at 3 a.m. and Cecile meets him at his hotel and asks her if he wants to be his girlfriend. They were officially in a relationship. Simon then brings the news to her how he needed to be honest about his life how he had a $70 million deal to complete, but the diamond industry can be dangerous, and how he's had threats to his surrounding security. Peter, his head of Israeli security, had had a hit on him, showing her pictures of bullets that, that they had got in the mail, funeral flowers being sent, a break into his Tel Avi apartment in Israel, and how he's just unsafe staying in London anymore, so he has to get away for a while. Cecile is scared for her new boyfriend, rightfully so, and promises just to be there for him every way she can. When she arrives home, Cecile and her friends googled the Levy family, learning they are one of the most powerful families in the world. They are big for a reason, and Cecile needs to understand what exactly Simon is involved in. She hasn't seen him for a while and becomes scared, so she logs back into Tinder to check out his profile, maybe showing where he's currently located. She sees he's in a different country, and also that his pictures have changed, which means he's been active and her heart sinks. She decides to ask him what exactly is going on, and Simon claims he no longer uses Tinder. He deleted the app off his phone and deleted that account. They're a team, and together, as a team, she has nothing to worry about. Suspicious, but okay. Simon was away a lot. He lived in a different city or country from Cecile, but they continued to talk and text every day. They decided to get an apartment together, and Simon tells Cecile that the budget per month is $15,000. She's going around the city of London, looking at all these different places and apartments, and FaceTime Simon to get his opinion. But if he can't be in London, where are they getting an apartment together? Four months after their initial meeting in Bulgaria, Cecile gets awoken in the night with a picture of Peter, Simon's bodyguard, and a message Peter's hurt. She's freaking out. All Simon is saying, they're going after me, thank God for Peter, if not, I would be dead. Insinuating that Peter took the attack for Simon. He reassures Cecile that everything is okay. I told you we're in a war, we need to be strong, and that they're safe now. The following morning, Cecile, who is still 
shaken up from the previous night gets a voice message from Simon claiming because of the current situation, security told him that he is not allowed to use any of his credit cards because they could be traced to his location. He asked Cecil one of the most bizarre favors I've ever heard. If Cecil has an American Express credit card, if he could have the numbers to the card, and link it to his account. If he could use our credit cards for some time, it would help him out, out a lot. It would just be temporary for like two weeks. Still's conflicted because she is his girlfriend. They trust each other and they want to help each other. No question or hesitation. She sends him her Amex Platinum card, which is in her name, and Simon starts using it and quickly maxes the card out. Can I just say, getting an Amex credit card is really, really hard. You have to be making at least high five to six figures before you can even qualify Plus, there are, the annual fees are insane. Simon makes a payment directly to the Amex on Cecile's max out card and gets a text message receipt from him. Simon claims that the money is on the way, but in the meantime, he needs her to head to Amsterdam and bring him $25,000 in cash. Cecile doesn't have that amount of cash, so she chooses to take out a loan and travels to a different country with that amount in her bag. Stressed out of her mind because because what is she going to say if security sees that amount of money in her bag? When they arrived back at where Simon was staying, Cecile finally felt some saint sanity. She was just scared to be away from him. Simon exclaimed how grateful he was to see her, how everything she was doing was helping him and keeping him safe. However, within hours, Simon's security team claims that there was an issue. He's forced to delete his Instagram profile as advised by his security and then immediately asked Cecile to make her profile private. Cecile is getting paranoid, having no idea what's going on. Later, Simon gets a call from Peter and places him on speaker. Simon, there's been a security breach. They know where you are. The plane is ready to leave. I can't tell you where you're going. Or ask if he can remotely turn off the lights to their location. Cecile is terrified of these enemies that are coming now and she just locks the door. Cecile is sent back home to London and is worried because the man she's in a relationship with is struggling mentally from what she can tell. Now remember the Amex car that is in Cecile's name? So she would have to pretend that she was the one traveling the world. Let me explain two things. I'm pretty just sure Cecile gave Simon her Amex card when she was in Amsterdam with him, so now it's in his possession. And two, whenever you travel somewhere, you have to alert your bank where you are so they don't flag purchases as fraud. Simon was using her card and traveling to new countries every day, so this card is constantly being flagged as fraud, which of course is understandable. I have to ask Simon constantly what the exact amount he was sending, which hotel he was staying in, etc etc or the card would remain blocked not believing Cecile was the one using the card. Simon warned her that this would happen but another problem arose when the credit limit wasn't enough. Somehow they had to get the maximum minimum limit raised because Simon had to be able to take care of his entire team. Simon says he's gonna employ Cecile at LLD Diamond. Someone calls her and gets her passport details so she can be put on the payroll. CEO Simon basically says if anyone calls, she works there. She gets pay slips for around $94,000 per month and sends those slips over to Amex and they raise the credit limit immediately. At this point, I'm unsure if Simon was paying her credit card at all except for that one time. So she starts to get worried because what if it's not paid back? Simon sends her a receipt from Credit Susie a Switzerland bank. He is making a $250,000 direct transfer to her, more than enough money to pay off what he's spending on this card. Here's the thing that I'm confused on though. If Simon can't use his account, how is he able to make this transfer? Red flag. I was heading home to Oslo, Norway to see her friends and family, and she really wanted Simon to join her as he was to visit her in London the very next day. But again, didn't he just say he can't be in London? But We'll address that later. Last minute, he claims that he can't visit at the moment because his security team told him that he needs to stay away. She is, of course, is disappointed, but the most important thing is that he's safe. Then Simon asks Cecil for more money. He needs to book tickets for his whole team, who he has to travel business class with, go out on expensive dinners with clients. The amount they are spending is astronomical. $20,000 is a lot of money. Lord knows that's a down payment on a house. And it was all spent. Again, Simon maxes out the Amex card after the limit had just been raised. What are you gonna do, forge more documents to show Cecil got another raise? Simon tells her to take out more loans. She does this time for $40,000. Every two to three days, Simon maxes out the card. Cecil gets another request for money. Every time he maxes out the card, she takes out a new personal loan. $50,000 to Instabank, $12,500 to DNB, $10,000 for a new credit card. This is all their conversations revolve around now getting Simon more money. The money has promised her hasn't even hit her account. All Simon says is he's already sent the money. No longer matters. What they need now is a solution to get him even more money. That's a pressure that Cecile has never felt before. That someone's life depends on you and what you're doing. If he uses his card, he could be in danger due to security threats. Simon is just sending her voice messages telling her everything she is doing. is showing him if she's the one for him. 
more loan, $20,000 to Monobank, $15,000. Cecile is now up to $250,000 in personal debt because of Simon. Look at Chunky. She never signed up for this. She eventually gets so fed up and annoyed that she just needs some kind of money. And at this point, Simon tells her that she can fly out to Amsterdam and get a check from him. Cecile flies over immediately and notices how Simon is colder towards her. All the affection is gone. There are clouds in his eyes hiding his true emotion. It's almost like he knew he wouldn't get any more money out of Cecile until she was paid back. They get to his apartment. The check is already made out with so much more money than the debt she had accumulated. They still tried to be together, but the spark was no longer there replaced by distance. Cecile arrives back to London and the first thing she does is try to cash the check. She needs this check to go through. She now has nine creditors to pay back, all emailing her constantly asking where their money is. Every day she is checking her account to see if the check has been posted. Four days later, no. Then she calls the bank asking why hasn't the check been cleared. They tell her they won't cash it. It won't go through. She'll tell Simon about the check and all he claims is that he gave her the money. He's done his part of the deal. Rather than give a solution, she's never heard him so cold. He was no longer her boyfriend at that point and the darkness sinks in. Cecile was over $250,000 in debt with no way to pay it back. She calls the Amex help and they hear over the phone how stressed she is and tell her to stay where she is and they will come to her. Cecile's freaking out thinking they're gonna arrest her, the documents she sent over for her credit limit were false. She told so many lies on the phone to get that card to work. She gave Simon her card. She tells the employees that come to her house everything. The whole truth. All they ask is she has a picture of this man. And when they see it, they look at each other and say, that's the guy. What name did he use? She responds with Simon Levy and they claim that's one of the many names he's been using. Cecile's beyond confused. Many names? Who is the man she's dating? They explain everything they know. Simon Levy is a professional who does this for a living, scamming women. He isn't the prince of diamonds, he isn't the son of a billionaire, everything was a lie. The man she loved was never real. He faked everything for a scam. Cecile feels horrible. In her mind, she still loves the man, or whoever he was. The fairy tale happening through her phone. Simon was still the human behind the phone. She wanted him to be true and she couldn't understand how someone could be so evil. Once the agents leave, she calls her mom and her mom tells her that she needs to go get back to Norway. You have to be there with family at a time like this. Cecile was going through all her messages with Simon. She was still asking how they were gonna get the money. His only response was, I'm working on it. So she decides to block it. There was nothing left to be said. That's when she remembers that he has her mom's phone number. He leaves a threatening message about her blocking him for no reason. Threatening her for every action, there's a reaction. He was super scared about, but her mom was even more fearful. They call the Norway police because he knows where her mom is living, where she was living, and all her passport details. He knows where she is. The police didn't care, and Cecil hadn't heard from him in days, having no idea where he is, having no idea what people love, and constantly being on edge. She had nine creditors on her, having to call each and every one of them to tell the situation. The interest on these loans were super high. They were gonna drown her, and she felt that. At one point, Cecil thought of offing herself, at that point, she checked herself into a psychiatric ward. She had no idea what else to do. As she was laying in her bed at the psychiatric ward, looking at the details on her phone of the people she had met, now knowing Simon was lying. But what about the others? Peter the bodyguard, Simon's ex with his daughter. She messages Amex asking if they could give her any more details about the man who defrauded her. Tell her to Google the name Simon Hayut. Again, probably butchering that, but all her answers will be there. An article pulls up in Finnish. And using Google Translate, she is able to read the article. Back in 2015, he was defrauding three Finnish women, claiming he was an Israeli multimillionaire. The women's names were protected. Simon was claiming that he was in the weapons industry with one woman and another. He was a Mossad agent. He goes to prison and comes out even worse because he had all that time to cook up a new scheme. Cecile had no, no idea who was going to stop it. She realizes she has to be the one to do so. She was going to expose Simon for who he really was and save potentially hundreds of other victims. Still messages the biggest newspaper in Norway, VG, hoping and praying they would take the investigation on. Now let's back up in the timeline. Now let's back up in the timeline to another woman whose relationship with Simon began around the same time his relationship with Cecil first began. I'm gonna mess up this name. Vanilla Sahome, a businesswoman from Stockholm, Sweden, was one day swiping through Tinder on her phone looking for a match. She had always been a very independent woman since the young age of 16. So she was looking for a funny, smart, and impulsive man to share her life with. Not someone who could financially take care of her. She was able to do that herself already. Like Cecile, Pernilla had her profile down to a science, with pictures of her dress in her professional work clothes, photos of her traveling and living her best life. She wanted to attract someone who was living the same lifestyle as her. Suddenly, she stumbled upon a profile. Same criteria I just said. Pernilla swiped right. It was a match. His name was Simon Levy. 
and he was in Stockholm for business, but was living in Amsterdam. Right away, he messages her asking if Pernilla wants to come visit him. He books her flight using her passport details for the very next day at 9 in the morning from Stockholm to Amsterdam. Pernilla Googles Sam and Levy, of course, right before she gets on a plane to meet him in person. His father was a diamond tycoon, which would surprisingly make this the second diamond guy Pernilla had dated. From the airport, she's picked up by his driver and taken to his house located in a nice neighborhood. Simon opens the door, dressed in designer clothing. Pernilla and him start having an easy conversation, having an instant connection, where you feel like you've known someone their whole life. They go out to lunch, the entire staff welcomes them, and immediately brings out an order of caviar, which they only carry for Simon. Food just keeps coming. He asks her a lot of personal questions and listens to her, her answers, which Pernilla likes. Afterwards, they take a nice stroll around Amsterdam and end up at a diamond museum. Simon tells her while at the museum, about all types of mimes, how do you cut them, and where in the world the best diamonds come from. Just everything there is to know about the diamond business and the process. He makes a move on Pernilla, and it just feels wrong. The two agree that it would be better to stay friends. There is really no romantic energy between the two. They have a great time, and Pernilla returns to Stockholm, the next day realizing how much she misses Simon already. They continue to talk every day. Wherever Simon would be, he would send her a selfie. They'd constantly send voice notes to each other. Pernilla just felt like Simon would charge her battery, keeping her going instead of draining her. One day, Simon just flew to Stockholm to have a coffee with Pernilla because she was having a bad day. Finally, one day, Simon sends a geotag. He landed in Stockholm. How romantic. Remember when Cecile was sent back to Amsterdam? This is where Simon goes after. Pernell and him meet up at a club, and there are so many champagne bottles Simon is ordering, and the girls are just swarming. He's paying cash, and everyone is plastered, including Peter, his bodyguard, which does not sound safe. Pernella decides she doesn't want to be in that environment and leaves, telling Simon they will talk tomorrow. The following morning, Pernella messages him if they could meet up for coffee to help him with his hangover. But he's already in Spain. I wonder where all that cash came from Simon was paying with, says Sil. Pernella was vacationing in Mykonos, Greece, and she was on the phone with Simon. He's telling her all about his new girlfriend, Polina, who is a typical Russian model. Quite young, but down to earth. Simon and Polina meet Pernella in Greece, and Pernella really likes her. Simon seems smitten, and they seem like a good match. Simon, of course, has booked the grand suite with a private pool and a room that cost around $5,000 per night. This is where Simon was when Cecile wanted him to come meet her parents and family in Oslo, Norway. While in Greece, they decide to go to Bobanir, also known as the Billionaires Club. The entry fee for one table is $2,000. Before anyone can offer to pay anything, Simon has already ordered a couple of bottles of champagne and has paid the tab. Simon and Panilla continue their summer tour in France, Vienna, then Switzerland. He invites Pernilla to meet them in Rome, Italy, taking a Rolls Royce Phantom to see all of the famous sites, such as the Spanish Stairs, the Colosseum, and the Trevi Fountain. At the end, they give each other just a giant hug and plan to meet up again soon, having just the most amazing vacation ever. Pernilla was at home one day when her phone started flashing with a text message from Simon. His father is being questioned by the police in a big diamond smuggling case. Russia is involved and the members of Simon's family are being arrested. She calls him and he is all over the place. The police have shut down all his accounts, including his credit card. Simon claims that the security situation in his life is bad. A couple of days later, he starts sending her a ton of messages. Someone had tried stabbing him and Peter broke his hand. It's the same photo as he sent to Cecile, just a different story. Nella asks what is going on and Simon claims his enemies are after. Simon sends her a voice message asking for a favor to borrow $30,000. Pernilla didn't have that type of money. She had been staying with her mother for three months, saving up to buy herself an apartment to live in. She was having an internal conflict. What is more important, buying herself an apartment or helping her friend with a security problem? She makes the bank transfer over the phone with Simon, and he's so thankful to have a friend that he can really trust. Soon after, Simon apologetically asks to borrow a bit more money. Pernilla tells him that he was supposed to already transfer back the money he originally borrowed after two weeks. Wondering if everything will be okay. Do you guys see Nova back there? Simon assures Pernilla everything will be okay, so she transfers him another $10,000. He guarantees her that he's going to be making a payment the following week. Simon sends a bank receipt showing that he transferred $100,000 to her. Pernilla thinks that he's being generous because at the time, he only ordered $40,000. Poor Pernilla had no idea how wrong she was. Can I just say something? This man is asking to borrow money because his bank funds are frozen and suddenly he's able to transfer a hundred thousand dollars issue because we can all forge documents i know i have at one point small things like a doctor's note for school that extends the note one more day just so i won't have to go back to the doctor to get a new note even though my doctor would have given me a note anyways it's easy 
This, this is the bank transfer right here that Simon sent to Pernilla. Picture of it. I can make this in like 30 seconds on Canva flat, okay? That's not how you make a forged document. You take a previous bank receipt and you copy it, like my direct deposit from school, my grants. I would copy it and I would... You know what? I'm not going to tell you how to forge a document. Okay? I don't want to be liable for anything. Money never cleared or arrived in Pernilla's bank account. Simon claims it was because the bank wanted him to be there with his lawyer physically to sign some release form of the fund. Pernilla now has lent Simon $40,000 with no repayment in sight, a bounce check deposit, and Simon has the audacity to ask for another favor for her to pay for the flights to get him to the bank so he can fix the issue. Pernilla does so using her American Express credit card. Simon claims that the money to repair has already left his account. It will go through again after he left the bank from the flights that she just paid for. She has nothing to worry about. Simon asked Pernilla to book him another flight, then another, then another. And over time, that bank transfer that Simon had guaranteed Pernilla would go through has not gone through. She voice messages him telling Simon that her bank can't find the transfer at all. She needs to pay her bills. How she's freaking out, pacing her room, knowing how much trouble she is financially. Pernilla's minimum payment alone on her Amex card is probably astronomical. Simon tells her that the bank has frozen all his accounts, which duh, did I not just say that earlier? He says he will book her flight to where he will be in a couple days and how she can get one of his watches worth over $100,000 so she can sell it and pay off the debt. Now this is where Cecile and Pernilla's stories collide. So let's go back in the storyline a bit to see where we left Cecile. VG News takes on the story that Cecile has presented to them. Video journalists Natalie Ramon Hansen and Christopher Kumar, along with investigative journalist Arlen Ofte Arston began investigating with the help of Cecile. Again, if I butchered those names, I'm sorry, I don't speak Norwegian or Swedish or Israeli. Those are like three main languages. Oh, and Finnish. I don't speak any of those. I can barely speak English if you can't tell. They can't believe the story they're being told. A guy who pretends to be a billionaire, son of diamonds. It felt like a fairy tale story. Private jets, world written dates, etc, etc. Erlen asks Cecile if she has any proof. You cannot print a story without real documentation. Cecile turns over all of her and Simon's conversations from WhatsApp. She's terrified that these porters, who are just strangers, reading all her thoughts, fears, and private selfies. But in her mind, the investigation and the evidence and the proof all came first. They received over 400 pages of just text messages, videos, pictures, audio messages with just an astounding amount. Looking to the autonomy of this relationship and seeing how it developed day by day. Now it's obvious to the reporters that Simon is a professional. This is what he does for a living. That the first date was made to be so good and otherworldly to leer Cecile in to believe that this man was a successful businessman. The whole ordeal was an emotional con promising a bright future with an extravagant apartment, European vacations, having a family, and getting married. Once that trust was built, Simon asked for the money only six weeks after they started dating. Over that month, he made Cecile fall in love with him, show him how wealthy he was, and make her afraid of his enemies that were after him. Cecile had no reason not to believe that Simon isn't good for the money. He had plenty to pay her back at a later date with. She had seen the expanse of his wealth. Simon kept himself surrounded by a lot of people his bodyguard, business partner, sometimes his daughter and her mother. The investigators how no, had no idea how deep this operation actually went. They reviewed the Finnish article Cecile sent them and developed the theory that Sahim Hayut and Simon Levy were the same person. Contacted the Finnish authorities to get the names of the three women along with their pictures. They sent their finding overs to Cecile to see if she recognized any one of the victims. One face was very familiar to her, the woman who was on the jet with her the mother of Simon's daughter. How the hell was she a victim standing trial and testifying against Simon in 2016, resulting in him being put behind bars, knowing full well he lied to her, and then three years later they're on a private jet together? My personal theory, and this was not ever confirmed by anyone, but it's my theory, it's what just makes more sense to me to put logic behind how this woman who literally was testifying against this man and now has a daughter with this man is that she was pregnant with Simon's child when she testified against him or they, they, that they were pen pals in jail and she got pregnant somehow with like a jail visit or whatever because the daughter they show in the film she looks to be around three to four ish maybe even younger but some somewhere between two and four so that would make sense. Woman 
talked Simon up to the point that Cecile trusted him. The investigators learned that it would be hard to trust anyone in this case. They also had to prove to police that Simon Yahuda Hayut and Simon Levy were the same person. Using the indictment they received from the Finnish police, they now have his real name and his date of birth. They googled Simon Hayut, but nothing came up. But one thing Simon and Simon had in common they were both from Israel. Now, I just need to pause here real quick because two things. Um, every time I wrote this script, I was writing Simon as Simone, so I was writing it S-I-M-O-E, S-I-M-O-N-E, -E, like Simo Simon, like Simone, when it was Simon. But this man, literally, Simon, S-I-M-O-N, and Simon, S-H-I-M-O-N, is the same name. It's the same damn name. It's like in, in the movie, uh, Shang-Chi, if you haven't seen it, it's the Marvel movie, where Shang-Chi, the superhero changes his name from Sean to Sean. It's the same name. It's the same damn name. Sean. S H A N G. Sean. Sean? Yeah. You change your name from Sean to Sean? Anyways, so the investigators contacted a journalist named Yuri who knew the country of Israel and spoke Hebrew. Yuri was able to track down an address from Simon Hayut in Israel and the four journalists traveled to the country. The outskirts of the city with narrow streets, small apartment buildings, and ultra-orthodox Jews is where they find themselves. A total 180 from the life Simon was presenting on his social media pages. This offer videographs everything that happens with Natalie and Yuri. They find a letter from the authorities asking for the money he owes people. At the address registered to Simon Hayut, they find Simon's mother looking for him, telling her he has swindled a woman in Norway for a quarter of a million dollars. Simon's mother had no contact with her son since he was 18. He changed his name and address, telling the guest the investigators he is no longer a Hayu, but now a Levy. To confirm that Simon and Simon are in fact the same person, the journalists go to the local police asking if a photo of Simon is a familiar face. The officers say yes, his name is Simon Hayu, but in 2017, he changed his name to Simon Levy. Man is the same person using multiple different names and who was a convicted man from Finland. Simon had been a fraudster since his late teens, and they started to piece the puzzle back together. In 2011, Simon was suspected of stealing a check from his employer and then moved to on to stealing checks and forging them. Simon was supposed to go to court for the charges, but instead he fled to Israel on a forged passport. He is now wanted by the Israeli police. The Israeli authorities are demanding that he be found so the trial against him can continue. In the information they gathered in Israel, the investigators try to pinpoint where Simon was at the moment. The investigators have a lot of information, but not, not have not found where Simon is at currently. They go back to the documents that Cecile gave them, including all the transactions made on her Amex cards. Natalie sees that there are flight tickets, along with the passenger's names, Simon's business partner, his bodyguard, and also the names of different women, one being Pernilla Sahome. So Erlen Arston, one of the investigators, sees that if, if he can find Pernilla on Facebook so he can message her. He writes her a message explaining to her about their investigation. Pernilla panics at the message, feeling like she's going to pass out, and immediately forwards the message to Simon. Simon calls her, claiming to her, her not to worry. This is just as enemies trying to get gauge information from her, trying to calm her down. But Pernilla chooses just to hang up the phone. Pernilla starts to realize that this can't be a made-up scenario from Simon's enemies to get information. Erlen calls Pernilla asking if he can fly to Stockholm to meet her to get her side of the story. She agrees and he flies in the very next day. The two meet the next day and Erlen tells Pernilla everything he knows. Roughly so, Pernilla is furious, wondering why Simon would do this to her. They were friends, someone who she cared so much and loved. He felt like he created this person of someone she would like and be good friends with. Erlen realizes that this isn't just romantic relationships Simon is pursuing with his scams, but also friendships. What else are they missing? Pernilla explains to Erlen about all the traveling Simon does, the amount of money he is spending, and all the people she has met through Simon. Erlen tells Pernilla about the Norwegian woman, Cecile, and how her story is so similar to Pernilla's. Pernilla realizes the amount of money that Cecile has lost to Simon, putting $50,000, a quarter of a million, does not add up to the lifestyle that Simon has been living, due to him spending an extreme amount of money. This is possibly the gigantic tip of the iceberg of Simon's schemes, which I think should have been the title of documentary, Simon's schemes, because anyways, Erlen is given permission by Pernilla to look at her bank accounts and comes to the conclusion, this may be a pawn. Simon uses Cecile's money on Pernilla, then uses Pernilla's money on another woman, and so on and so forth the definition of a Ponzi scheme, where only the person at the tip of the top is making money. Also never his name on the card, so he has the excuse to always say that he's just borrowing some money. It's the perfect scam. Erlen Arson explains it best. Simon is using one woman's credit card to pay for plane tickets to visit the second woman, and then uses the second woman's credit card to buy dinner for the third woman. 
and continue and continue and continue. He's also able to use the woman's credit cards to travel a lot, never staying in one place for a long time. This made it hard for local police authorities of small countries with low budgets to track him out. I just wanted to take a moment to clarify that last statement and say something. I think as far as I'm concerned, and I'm gonna get into some more Simon's victims in a bit, but none of Simon's victims were from the United States that were stolen like a majority of money from. So not in the way that like Cecil was which is quarter of a million, but I'll, I'll explain that a little more. I feel like he was very calculated in his things to do because if there's one thing that Americans love doing, especially the government, it's that it's wasting time and money in the city. Yeah, especially on the police. The police task force would probably track him down way too quickly here in America or just have the whole thing blow over. So that's probably one of the reasons why he wasn't ever in America or didn't swindle many people from here. Arlen ends their long conversation by asking Pernilla if she knows where he's at. Pernilla gives the investigation their golden ticket. Not only does she know where he is or where he's gonna be, but she's going to be on a flight to meet with him tomorrow in less than 10 hours in Munich, Germany. Investigators get on a flight with Pernilla and fly to Munich. Their goal was to film him to prove to the police that Simon was possible to find and that then they knew where he was. All you had to do was try. Felt the pressure. They had only one chance to get the proof they needed and the responsibility to keep Pernilla safe along with making sure Simon cannot find out about this or what Pernilla had done. The situation could be dangerous for her. She was going to sabotage his life. Natalie was tracking Pernilla at all times using their iPhones. They had each other in each other's phone numbers saved under fake names in case Simon got a hold of Pernilla's phone. Pernilla let investigators know through text that she had landed and her friend, Simon, was picking her up. The signal for the photographer that is outside the airport to get a place for some pictures. They get a picture of Simon from the photographer that he is in fact in Munich, Germany. I know I've said that like three different ways now. I'm sorry, I seriously have no idea how you pronounce that word. Again, don't speak German, even though my mother's side of the family is partly German. It now is on high alert. It's the first time she also meets Simon's business partner, Avishe. She is paranoid because who is she really getting in the car with? She knows the truth of this man and all the love she felt for her friend is gone and instead of a place with hatred. Pernilla lets Natalie know that they were headed to the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, a really fancy hotel with a restaurant inside. They set up Christopher and the photographer there for when they leave the restaurant to capture photos. They set up behind the restaurant's parking garage between a gap in the wall to capture Simon when he walks out. Staff at the hotel all welcome Simon back and it infuriated Pernilla, questioning in her head, how many victims does Simon have in Muschnitz, Germany? Simon tells Pernilla an extravagant story about what happened to her money and he gives her the watch. Of course, Simon orders everything off the menu and Pernilla feels bad because she knows he's using some other woman's credit card to pay the bill. As they leave the restaurant, the photographer captures a photo of Simon right before he looks directly in the direction and they hide. Simon turns to his business partner, Avishay, and speaks in Hebrew, pointing out the cameraman and rushing everyone into the car. They speed away through Mochnich and Pernilla tells herself that she needs to put on her best acting debut of her life and twist the whole situation on Simon. Asking him if it's his enemies that they're that are after her now, he just claims that it's him they're after. Pernilla demands them to drop her off and she never gets out of her car so fast. At this point, the investigation gets in contact with Pernilla again, understanding that they can't confront Simon about his scam now and they all fly back to Oslo, Norway on the next step and Pernilla flies back to Stockholm. After they sell back in, Pernilla takes the watch to a pawn shop and as you can guess, it's totally fake. Pernilla decides that she's had enough and she wants to talk to Simon over the phone. Natalie is recording the call for evidence and you can actually listen to part of this phone call in the Netflix documentary. I can't put it in because Netflix owns the right to most of the story. Simon and Pernilla say the usual, hello, how are you, and do your greetings, sort of blah blah blah, and Pernilla lets it all out. She isn't doing well. If, if Simon could tell her the truth, his denial, and how she's lost everything because of the money she's lent him, he claims it's all his enemies, and that's when she loses it. How she knows the whole truth. How she's do how he's doing this fraud scheme, how he went to jail in Finland, how he's defrauding other people. Simon goes off on her, telling Pernilla if she double crosses him, she will pay for the rest of her life. Pernilla hits him back with how she already was. He's taken everything from her and now she has no way to pay those debts back. Simon threatens her claiming, goes and makes claims against him. It's her mistake. Just give him the evidence she has. But she has no physical evidence. That's what the investigators have. She just knows that they're telling the truth. Bella tells him how the Israeli police have confirmed his picture. She asks him who paid for her flight to Amsterdam. He claims it was him, but she has proof that the seat was paid for by another woman. Of course, Simon claims he couldn't use his own card, so he paid someone in cash to use their card. 
Pernilla finishes the call, just saying Simon will face consequences. Pernilla, of course, was scared because what has she done? The only thing they can do now is make the VG article as big as possible. So his face can be out there. People will know who Simon is and how he can never do this to anyone again. Cecile understood that coming forward with a story like this takes a lot of courage. She felt anxious. VG is the biggest newspaper in Norway, and her face was about to be on the cover, plus on the online spreads. People are going to judge her, and her life will never be the same again. The article went out, and it spread like wildfire. And I I remember seeing this article, okay? I don't think I read it right away, but I remember reading it. Social media was saying both women were gold diggers, but who deserved this? But would a gold digger give money to the person they wanted money from? Pernilla never understood how someone could blame a victim. She told her story to prevent other people from being a victim of Simon. Cecile saw past the hate comments after a while. There were thousands of shares, comments after comment, and the story quickly went viral. The investigators, Natalie, Kristoff, and Erlen, watched the numbers on the article go up. Everyone wanted to read about the Tinder swindler, exactly what Cecile and Pernilla wanted. No matter where Simon went, who he met, if he introduced himself, all that person would have to do is Google him, and the article would show up. After the article was published, Cecile and Pernilla met in person, immediately having this unbreakable bond and connection. They were the only two people who had been victims of Simon's and were named in this expose article. Together, their goal was to keep the momentum up. This story needed to be in every newspaper in every country possible. Talk shows and news agencies in Israel, the United States, the United Kingdom, Netherlands, Germany, they still felt like they needed more exposure in more countries for them to make their own investigations to see if Simon had pulled his Ponzi scheme in their country. Natalie, one of the investigators, started receiving messages from all the other victims in the world. Natalie, one of the investigators, started receiving messages from other victims all over the world. And this is where I'm going to talk about some of those United States victims. There's not many that have come forward. A woman who met him on Tinder in 2015, and they met up in Copenhagen, Denmark. He used the name, I'm going to butcher it, Madarachi Tapirio. He spent $20,000 of her money. Another woman who dated him for six months, he met her friends and family, a man from New York that Simon stayed with. He said he used the name Simon Hayu. Another man who hired Simon to babysit their five-year-old son. Simon, 20 years old at that time, claiming his father was a rabbi that came from a wealthy family. In three days, he spent $42,000 on their stolen Amex card. Another woman who Simon told that he was a heir to the Israeli airline, and he hired her as his personal assistant. He spent nearly $50,000 of her money. Another man that Simon hired as his personal chauffeur, he rented out a lot of expensive cars but never paid the bill. All of $300,000 of it. There the checks he used were forged. Another woman claiming he told her that he was a Mossad agent working undercover as a pilot. Which, how, do you, how does that make sense? She's still scared of him six years later. Natalie, one of the journalists, knew they had all this information, but nothing had happened to Simon. He was still on the run as a free man, even though he had been reported to the police in at least seven different countries. So this is where the last of Simon's three victims we saw in the documentary come in. Eileen Charlotte was at the airport in Prague, Gazette Republic, after visiting her boyfriend, waiting for her plane to leave, scrolling through Instagram, when she saw a picture of her boyfriend with an article linked to it. She clicked on it and saw the VG article, The Tinder Swindler. In complete shock, she sends the article to her boyfriend, Simon. He immediately starts calling her but her plane is about to take off. So she offline downloads the article to her phone and places it on airplane mode. Eileen is reading the article and she sees a Norwegian woman named Cecile who also met Simon on Tinder. He also took her to a five-star restaurant for their first date. Eileen had been dating Simon at this point for 14 months. It was a serious relationship. They were in love and Simon remembered every little detail and was very thoughtful with her. They were talking about settling down and starting a family. She felt like they were meant for each other. As she scrolls through the article, she sees videos popping up of Simon claiming how he misses Cecile, how he can't wait to see her and loves her. He sent the same identical messages to Eileen. And I think this is very genius in the VG article, I want to say real quick, that they had it wasn't just an article. If you, I'll link it down below so you can read it. And if you don't want to read it, because I'm basically summarizing everything here, um, at least scroll through it to look how they did this. It was very good journalism. So they'd have the article in writing, but they also had videos pop up as you scroll through of like messages he sent to like Cecile and Pernilla. It, it's very well done, and I think it's a very innovative way to tell a story, especially a true crime story. So she starts going through her WhatsApp conversation history with Simon and compares it to the article. He is sending the exact same words to her as he did to Cecile. He took Cecile to Amsterdam. 
Eileen's hometown during when they were dating. As Cecile is looking for homes for the two of them in London to live in, Eileen is doing the same thing in Amsterdam. The day he was flying to Oslo for a business trip, he really went to see Cecile in her hometown only messaging Eileen that he was tired. Of course he was tired, he was with Cecile that night. He tells her about a business deal in Muntnich that went wrong, but it was during the time that he was with Pernilla, who was gathering the photographic evidence of Simon's location. He sends Eileen the same pictures and videos of Peter, the bodyguard, beating up. She was terrified of those pictures. They caused her to become paranoid, always looking over her shoulder. Here's the really messed up thing. A few years back, Eileen was followed and jumped by two men. Simon knew this and played on her fears. Simon told her, told Eileen that she was being followed, and she was constantly riddled with anxiety. She continues reading the article, that Simon is a convicted criminal and fugitive, how he has swindled millions from women, and that's when Eileen's heart stopped. She had lent him money. It all started small. Simon claimed his enemies were tracking his phone, so he asked for some money for some SIM cards. She was paying those bills off, and more and more money related. In total, Eileen had given him $140,000, which Simon blew on designer clothes, flight tickets for other women, and fancy dinners. She was riddled with so many emotions. While the boyfriend of hers for over a year had been cheating on her, all the money she lent him. In one short flight, her life turned upside down. When that plane landed, she needed to face reality, and that scared her. Eileen knew the moment she landed back in Amsterdam, Simon would call her because she was unable to pick up his call before the flight. He claims that the article was fake. His woman, Pernilla and Cecile, were paid by his enemies to create the article. Eileen knew he was lying, but that she had been defrauded. She talks to her local police, and they need time to build a case. Time is something that Eileen knew she didn't have because Simon was a lifetime criminal. The moment he could flee, he would. So she decides to talk to one of the women in the article and she finds Pernilla on Instagram and messages her. Pernilla receives a DM from a Dutch woman named Eileen claiming she is the current girlfriend of Simon. She's reading the article and felt that she's in the middle of a horror movie of truth at the moment. Two women talk on the phone and Eileen claims she's gonna help the three journalists along with the other two victims catch Simon. But there's one thing she needs to do first, figure out a way to get some of her money back. After their talk, Eileen realizes that she's in a very powerful position. Simon is unable to flee Prague where she left him because he can't swindle any more women on Tinder. His face was all over Google, social media, and the news. Simon had nowhere to go to but his current girlfriend Eileen, and using Simon's own advice, she keeps her friends closer, her new friend, Pernilla, and her enemies closer, her boyfriend, Simon. Her plan sets into action to get some of her money back and to get Simon caught. Eileen needs to make sure Simon believed that she was still on his side, so she messages him that she loved him, believed everything he said, and even called Pernilla and Cecile vindictive bitches. She was talking to Simon nonstop, and of course Simon being Simon asked Eileen for more money. He claims he needs it to escape from his enemy. He needs to get fake passports. He wants Eileen to pawn her car and sell her house. Like what the hell, I would never do that and I'm so glad Eileen didn't. This is when Eileen gets her golden idea of how she's going to swindle the swindler and get some of her money back. Simon only wears designer clothes, always in Versace, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Dolce and Cabana. Eileen works in luxury fashion. She knows his closet is worth. She asks him to let her sell some of his clothes for him to generate some money. And I, I just want to pause here real quick, another little note real quick. I'm going to go into this more. Luxury clothes and always being in them to me, tell me that you want your clothes to talk for you. And I'm, I'll talk about later. I just want to keep you with that thought right now. Simon tells her yes. He has all of his clothes with him and Eileen would need to go back to Prague, Suzette Republic. However, before she leaves Amsterdam, Simon has a credit card shipped to her home to bring to him. The name David Sharon is printed a new alias. Eileen sends a picture to the police of a new credit card, letting them know that he was creating a new identity. He has no physical address to track him down because he obviously he shipped that card to Eileen in Amsterdam, claiming that it's his address. And also David Sharon, that's like the whitest name I've ever heard. Eileen lands in Prague to Simon waiting for her. He forcefully kisses her and hugs her. Eileen was disgusted, and the only thing she could spit out was the I love you and I miss you. They go to the appointment Simon made for himself in the center of Prague, and they're at a plastic surgery. Simon wants to change his cheekbones, nose, lips, and chin. The doctor refuses to do the operation because only criminals want those procedures done. Eileen almost told the doctor that he was a criminal and spits out her water. The two of them are back at the hotel and Simon is pathetically crying into her lap because this doctor refuses to do the plastic surgery he wanted. Also, I want to know who would pay for the surgery, like whose money is he using to pay for that surgery. Later that afternoon, they played a couple, held hands, had a nice dinner, but that night, Eileen had to sleep next to him. Luckily, Simon did not want to try to start any intercourse, but she was up all night frozen. Morning comes, Eileen packs three massive suitcases filled with Simon's clothes with no help from him. 
because of course, why would he help her? Before she leaves, Simon gives her a letter to read on the plane. The letter says that this is the most difficult time of his life, thanking her for being at his side, not giving up on their love. She's the woman of his dreams. He can't wait to build a life together, having kids, marrying each other. However, she has to help him with everything she can for their future, her parents, and now it's time to make the impossible possible. How blessed he is to have her, how he's never loved someone as much as her. Don't give up on him and how they will have happily ever after. Just a lot of horseshit, pretty much. Alina arrives back in Amsterdam and is on Operation Sell, Sell, Sell Simon's Clothes. Simon won't stop texting, asking if she sold anything, where that money is, and how she needs to be quick. Eileen tells him how she hasn't sold anything, when in reality, she's selling so much of his stuff, and to this day, is still selling those clothes. Simon claims he needs the money from his clothes by the following Monday, that Eileen was just stalling for another day, dragging her time out. At this point, it had been three weeks since she took his clothes. After those couple of weeks, Simon realized that Eileen was keeping all the money she made off of his clothes to herself. Simon changed his attitude completely by boarding her with 20 minute aggressive messages like who would ever listen to 20 minute messages I realize as I say this is probably gonna be like a two hour YouTube video anyways then apologizing and repeating the cycle she saw his true personality it was a horrible time mentally for Eileen being constantly berated but at the same time she was enjoying watching him squirm Simon had truly hit rock bottom after Eileen discovered the truth the VG article went out and he could no longer swindle new women Simon asked Eileen for one more favor if she can buy him a lottery ticket with the numbers of his choosing that's so pathetic this guy who claims to be a billionaire needs to play the lottery Simon no longer had any money coming in he had no one to go to or anyone to swindle he even tried to play on Eileen's empathy sending her pictures and texts of him eating leftover foods at the shopping mall he even grew out this big ugly beard to sort of hide his identity and he, how he was sleeping in hostels for $12 a night. This was the real Simon. Without other people's money, he had nothing and was a nobody. He called himself a homeless king. The so-called Prince of Diamond was homeless. Oh so sad. After a few weeks, Eileen gets a text from Simon saying he wants to go to Greece. She messages him back, but the text won't go through. She knew that he was on a plane at that moment because Simon is never not on his phone. She searches on the internet for flights from Prague to Athens and found one at least that at the exact same time she messages Simon and it did not go through. Eileen screenshots the details and sends it over to the police. She knew he wasn't traveling under the name Simon Levy because he was wanted for fraud. She told the authorities that he was probably flying under the name David Sharon. She left the situation in the hands of the police. The next couple of hours were the best in her life. Please tell Eileen that Simon was arrested by Interpol on a fake passport under the name David Sharon. Eileen messages Pernilla that they got him. Simon had been arrested. Pernilla then calls Cecile and tells her the news. They both felt so relieved and Cecile just needed to see Simon in handcuffs for herself. Up until the documentary came out, Simon had no clue that it was Eileen that had him turned in. He never believed that she was capable of doing so. Pernilla felt so satisfied. Everything that three women had done had a positive effect. They had helped save more people from the scams and got him arrested. Maybe not on everything they wanted, but their actions had a positive reaction. Cecile is still on Tinder. She did not let Simon's scam stop her from looking for love. Tinder had no hand in this. It was all Simon. She is currently still single. Now here's the aftermath that the documentary supplies us with. Simon Levy was sentenced to 15 months in Israel for the crimes he committed there. He was released after only five months served. Since his release, Simon has launched a website offering business advice for a fee of $311. Sounds like a scam to me. Simon is currently living in Israel as a free man and no longer appears to have financial issues, living an extreme life of luxury again and flaunting it on social media. Instagram to be specific. He has been back on Tinder. He has a current girlfriend who is also an Israeli model. Peter, the bodyguard, and Avishai, business partner, have never been charged with any legal activity related or associated with Simon. The mother of Simon's child denies any wrongdoing. Simon and his Russian girlfriend, Polina, split when she found out he was cheating on her. But not for the fraud thing, I guess. That was that should have been clear. As we all could have guessed, Simon has absolutely no connection to the Israeli billionaire Lev Levion or the Levy Diamond family. There is no no evidence against or formal charges brought against LLD Diamonds or the Levy family for diamond smuggling. I like what Simon claims about his family's enemies. Cecile, Pernilla, and Eileen are still paying off their debts from Simon. Simon has never been charged with defrauding them. It has been theorized that he has swindled over $10 million from people all over the world. Netflix asked Simon to be part of the documentary, and in Simon fashion, he threatened the company in a voice message, claiming everything that woman they have said is a lie, and that he's gonna file a lawsuit against the company for lies and defamation. He can't even say defamation properly. 
which is really funny to me. Now, here's everything that happened in real life. Everything I just said is true. That was everything that the documentary provided us with. But now I wanna go over some details that the film did not cover or choose to ignore along with what has happened since the film has come out and some new development. The documentary makes it seem like Simon only had the six victims, the three Finnish women and Cecil, Pernilla, and Eileen, six. But that's not true. Not all victims have come forward and possibly not all of them ever will, but it is calculated that Simon has swindled nearly $10 million. And I also talked about a couple of those victims earlier that came forward after the VG article came out. So keep that in mind. There's a possible hundreds, if not thousands of victims in the world. I also wanted to talk about all three victims we met along with Simon's girlfriend, Holina, and his mother's child. They all look alike. Like it's eerily weird. They all look alike. They all have like the same. They all have blonde hair. They all they're all thin with colored eyes, usually like a blue, green, gray color. And they're absolutely gorgeous. Like they could all be models. They're beautiful women. So Simon obviously has a type. All three of the women we met had an American Express card. Now here's my theory with this. Simon was a master scammer. He was matching with these women on Tinder. And in the words of Cecile, I believe he was Googling each of his victims and looking into their social media accounts to get a feel of how much these women earn a year. As far as I know, Tinder doesn't have a feature to write how much you make on your profile a year unless you put like billionaire in the caption of your description, which Simon was doing. He was leading with the pretension that that he had all this money. All these women made money in the high five to six figure range at the least. The American Express credit cards are something that I want to explain more, like I said earlier, because the documentary didn't do much to, to touch on that how important the, their use to this whole operation was. So the American Express credit card is a unique card unlike a Discover credit card or a Capital One credit card or all the other credit cards that exist because an American Express card is accepted in most countries with no question asked or no international fees applied. Along with how hard it is to get an Amex card. In order to even qualify for an Amex card, you have to be making at least $50,000 a year, have a credit score of a 720 or higher, and have no credit priors in two years. Now, let me explain this a little more. A lot of people make at least $50,000 a year, but they don't have the other two requirements, which is really hard to achieve. A 720 credit score is only 130 points away from being perfect, with only 42% of Americans having this score or higher. The no credit priors for two years means that you cannot have any inquiries on your credit for at least two years. That means not opening a new credit card, applying for a loan, buying a new car or house. All those actions run your credit and place a damper on your score. That's hard to do because even if you have the income and the credit score, having clean credit is not something a lot of people are able to maintain for two years straight. That's just getting approved. Then you get to pick your card. And we talked about the Platinum Amex card in the story. The yearly fee on that card alone is 670. That's just the fee to have the card. Even if you don't use it, like you just have the card, still paying $670 a year. Next, the limit on most Amex cards don't have a limit, but some do. Those limits start at $50,000 and can go up. Also, you can only request to raise your limit every six months. That's why when Simon forged those documents for Cecile to send to Amex, claiming she made $94,000 a month, her limit was raised immediately. But they couldn't do that again because of how many times you can ask for a raise in a year. So even let's say she did make $94,000 a month and then a month later she gets a raise to make $150,000 a month. You can't send that in until six months later because she just changed her. Last interesting fact about the Amex cards is that they have to be paid back in full every month. The cards also have an air prestige around them. If you have one, in a weird way, it's status symbol. You want to spend $10,000 in April? Go for it, sure. But when that bill comes next month, you have to pay it in full. That's why Cecile was so worried about Simon not paying her card back because spending that amount of money in one month and not paying it back can send you into bankruptcy. That's why I think Simon was stalking these women on Google and social media to see if they had this card for him to use it or at the very least their company Amex card. I know what you're wondering as to why Cecile, Pernelia, and Eileen never had their debts or loans erased by the creditors and credit cards. Well, that's because these banks and loans and whatever want their money back. They don't care if you didn't spend the money and were swindled out of it. They're are getting their money back no matter what. The three women have a GoFundMe up for $600,000 to pay off their debt from Simon and to cover the interest that's accumulated. And I just hope they don't misuse those funds and fully become debt free with the help from the public's aid. That GoFundMe will be linked down below. All women still work in their respective fields. Pernilla is a small business owner. Eileen works for high-end fashion still. And Cecile works as a senior UX and service designer for a Paris-based software company and serves as the founder of Action Reaction. 
Action, a nonprofit organization that raises awareness on frauds and scams. I'm unsure if Vanilla or Eileen are also founding members of the organization because there is very limited information available on this nonprofit. However, I am under the assumption that they might be because Action Reaction is the exact words Pernilla spoke when she found out about Simon's arrest and how it made her feel. The last two things before we get into what happened since the documentary came out. I'm confused as to how Simon tricked Pernilla and Cecil. He would need their bank account numbers and like my school has my bank account numbers for when they deposit my grants every year at the beginning of each semester directly to me and I just receive an email receipt with the forms a week before it all comes in. Was Simon doing more of like a sell thing? Like I can send my mother $20 right now using her phone number but I don't need anything more than that. I don't know her debit card number or her bank account number details. That part confused me and I couldn't find an answer anywhere online. Finally, a word of advice and I talked about this earlier I would get back to this about the designer clothing. If someone is covered head to toe in designer clothing all the time and is always showing off on social media them shopping at luxury stores, they are wanting their clothes and purchases to leave them. That person wants you to look at them and say they have money because a real person is secure enough with their money and wealth to not leave with their clothes or purchases. They do not care what you think about them or what your thoughts on them are. Okay, they're secure with their money and their wealth and that's it. Screw the world. So Simon constantly buying everything on the menu, paying large tabs, renting expensive vehicles, and wearing designer clothing 24-7 shows that he really did not have the money for me. You don't hear about, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg. You know, not even Mark. You don't hear that type of thing, okay? And isn't it like a saying that the rich stay rich by not spending money? So it's totally okay to, to post your purchase from Louis Vuitton once in a while, but not shopping in store, swiping your debit card, putting the item in your car, and you opening the box to wear the item. It's just too much of an overkill and not doing that every single day like Simon does. I mean, doing it maybe once in a while, posting something like that to like a reel or a TikTok or whatever, that's just weird. Like I follow someone on Instagram called the Rich, rich Lady Problems and this woman is rich, but she's not there in Louis Vuitton store shopping and showing you and doing everything. She's just showing you her purchase. Not even the receipt, not even the price. She's just showing, hey, I bought this and let me unbox it for you. That shows someone that is secure in their wealth. Now here is what has happened in the two months since the documentary has come out. Many more women have come forward claiming that they have been conned by Simon and that an estimated $10 million is in swindled money has been rapidly going up. That amount is going up. Simon Levy has been permanently banned from dating apps Tinder, Plenty of Fish, and OkCupid, all apps owned by the same company. Simon has been seen on Instagram thanking all of his new supporters until Instagram deleted his profile. It is unclear if all the new counts in his name are real or otherwise other scammers or fans or whatever impersonating him. Simon has been interviewed on Good Morning America and claims everything said about him has been lies. He also had a new blonde girlfriend by his side in every interview, which is like really ironic to what I just said earlier. It is unclear if he will be facing charges in any other countries or remain a free man. Okay, this is my favorite part about this whole story. Uh, Simon now has a Hollywood agent along with big plans to write a book. I wonder if he's actually gonna write that book himself or pay someone to write it for him because this man does know hard labor. His definition of hard labor is scamming people. A book I would read, however, would be a book by Eileen, Cecil, and Pernilla if they ever wrote one. He also joined the app where all people's careers go to die, Cameo. The app you can pay people for just personal messages. He's charging a laughable $200 per video message. And as we know, Simon loves to send video messages. Simon wants to be the star of a show like The Bachelor where women are competing for his love. Are we surprised? Are we surprised? He also claims that this show is currently in production. Lastly, Simon wants to host a podcast and that's just what we need. Another man hosting a podcast. Last information I have on updates is that Peter, Simon's bodyguard, is suing Netflix Amsterdam for $3 million euros via an attorney for defamation and compensation. I guess Simon and him have something in common, suing for defamation, or at least threatening Simon's case because the boy never keeps his promise. The documentary wasn't even about Peter, who was just a side character to Simon's scheme. Netflix even said that Peter has not been linked or charged directly to any of Simon's schemes. They never even gave us his last name or if Peter was his real name or an aliases like Simon's Dave and Sharon name. We also only saw slivers and pictures of 
Peter. I wouldn't be able to pick him out of the lineup even if I tried, but if the shoe fits, Peter, you know, if the shoe fits. Sadly, we don't know how much money Simon has made off of fans and the documentary since it came out, but let me tell you, if you paid him anything, he scammed you too. All right, so that is the case of the Tinder swindler, Simon Hayut, or Simon Levy or whatever he's going by now. Let me know what you think of this new series. If you liked it, I wanted to start off with something simple, easier to follow. So we talked about the documentary and then we talked about real life and clarifying some more details that were not talked in the documentary and life updates. So let me know if you like it down below. I have a bunch more coming. Seriously, I think I have all the way to like July, August of these videos planned because there's just so many of these documentaries coming out and shows and movies and whatever. So let me know down below. Um, the picture of the week, the doggy picture of Capella sitting on the dining room table because she was tired. She takes naps up there. It's, it's really weird. It's what having a husky is like. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. All my socials are linked down below. If you want to follow me on anyone, I will be posting in May twice a week, I hopefully so. I'm trying to get back into it. Writing these scripts always take forever and I need to tell myself and remind myself how much they take to write because this one alone took 15 hours. Yeah, I was reading through the transcript of the Netflix show like word by word, copying, pasting it, writing what I wanted to say. Yeah, anyways, love you, mean it, kisses. Don't, be, don't get scammed by Simon. Don't do anything stupid and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.